Somehow, it's been a year since The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom released on the Nintendo Switch. What the fuck? I've been a lifelong fan of the Zelda series ever since I dived into the series with Twilight Princess, and I've loved nearly every entry ever since. And last year, I made a mini-series looking to everything that Tears of the Kingdom did, and it was amazing. I love Tears of the Kingdom so much, and it was my game of the year in 2023. While some people might think it's underwhelming, I can never stop loving it. And while I think I've gotten better in editing and writing, I wasn't too bad here. So, I hope you enjoy this compilation. A common complaint that I heard that people had with Breath of the Wild story is that there wasn't enough. Most of the story took place a century ago with nearly nothing else going on in the modern times. While Tears of the Kingdom doesn't completely fix every issue, it does improve in most of the areas. A lot of Breath of the Wild's story revolved around the Great Calamity, which isn't a bad thing at all. The story was always meant to be tragic and filled with melancholy. I just believe there wasn't enough time to grow attached and to really get to know the new champions. Before boarding Divine Beast Van Mado, we just had to shoot arrows at targets. That's disappointing as hell. Tears of the Kingdom fixes the lead up perfectly with much, much better missions. My favorite one was Goron City with the Gorons addicted to crack. And Unibo, he was so hilarious. <laughs> Kinda sad that he wasn't like this for the entire game. Tears of the Kingdom takes more risks with its story and while it's more linear this time, I think it's for the best. We get to see more of the current Hyrule that we've never seen before. Of course, the story is helped by the fact that our villain this time is Ganondorf versus Calamity Ganon. While not required, the memories that you can collect through the Dragon Tears gives more backstory to the upheaval and to the new characters that we've seen throughout the game. In addition, now you can physically see where the memories are via a geoglyph which helps a lot with locating them. Look me in the eyes and tell me that I was supposed to know where to go with just this. I always found the memory of Link falling in battle to be tragic and emotional. Showed off how good the game's story could have been, yet it never reached the heights of that again. Age of Calamity did help with getting to know the champions better, but at the same time, it's not a tragedy and it doesn't take risks. In addition to being slightly better, Tears of the Kingdom also does a lot. In Breath of the Wild, the Zonai were a background element, but now, they're the main focus of Tears of the Kingdom. They were always an interesting piece of lore that was never explored further. We still don't see a lot, but we get to see that the Zonai were an incredibly advanced civilization that were mystical. Speaking of the Dragon Tears, these are Tears of the Kingdom's versions of memories that looks into the ancient Hyrule, an unknown amount of time deep in the past. This is where we find out more about the Zonai, with only two remaining. One is Raru, and the other is Mineru. Remember how Zelda is trying to find a way back to modern Hyrule? She fucking fails. Instead, she works alongside Raru and eventually becomes a sage to fight against the demon king Ganondorf. I loved this, and the last time we saw sages in the Zelda franchise was 2012's A Link Between Worlds, over a decade ago. So. In Tears of the Kingdom, each sage has been tasked with taking down Ganondorf as he grows stronger and stronger, thanks to the tear amplifying his power that he stole from Sonya. Even with the power of the sages, the sages fail to take down Ganondorf. Sensing no other ways to stop the Demon King, Raru bravely decides to sacrifice himself, and we see the remnants of this at the opening of the game, with his arm sailing away Ganondorf. Alongside this explaining why there is this weird arm on Ganondorf, this is also a brilliant way to explain the origins of the Calamity, and the malice seen in Breath of the Wild. So, back to ancient Hyrule. With the king and the queen gone, and Mineru severely injured, morale is low. Zelda is able to restore the Master Sword with her light magic, but it would take a long time. An extraordinarily long time. Zelda does the unthinkable, and she gives up. Just kidding. She swallows her tear and becomes a dragon through a process known as draconification. The story isn't perfect, but it's moments like this where Nintendo does something new that makes me enjoy the story a lot more. In previous Zelda games, getting the Master Sword was the same boring thing. You just had to go to the Lost Woods and retrieve it. In Tears of the Kingdom though, they changed it and made it so damn cool. You have to retrieve it from Zelda or the Light Dragon and pull it out of her head. So, there's one thing I like to say whenever I'm feeling down. Whenever I'm feeling gloomy from No Twilight Princess on the Switch. Tears of the Kingdom is Skyward Sword if it was good. Of course, I'm kidding. Both are two very different games with two very different goals. Though, I will say that Tears of the Kingdom takes the general idea of Skyward Sword and expands on the concept to make it even better than before. 
and I love it. Skyward Sword has islands in the sky, obviously, and an undiscovered world. The problem is that the world in Skyward Sword was extremely linear and disconnected, which did hurt a lot as a Zelda fan. In addition, there weren't a lot of islands that were interesting, other than the Great Pumpkin and Skyloft. Breath of the Wild took the original The Legend of Zelda idea and massively expanded on that. I feel like Tears of the Kingdom takes a lot of cues from Zelda 2. In both games, Hyrule has been massively expanded. Both games feel more lived in, with more to do, and both have much better music. While I do find myself disappointed with the fact that there aren't a ton of Sky Islands, it's still a nice addition to the game and builds upon the foundations created by Breath of the Wild. In the story, the Sky Islands are really important. In fact, in the story we start out on a Sky Island, called the Great Sky Island, which is the Great Plateau of this game. This is where we learn how to be Link again, and learn our new abilities, which I'll touch on later in the video. We get this amazing opening like Breath of the Wild, but now with Link skydiving into the Great Sky Island. Tears of the Kingdom is great, and thanks to the developers reusing the same base world, it has a lot of different gameplay loops. Whenever I'm feeling tired of the skies, I go to the main overworld. Whenever I'm feeling bored of the main overworld, I go to the depths. And whenever I get bored of the depths, you get it. I would never say that Breath of the Wild is boring, because it's not. But Tears of the Kingdom opens up and lets you do exactly what you want to do. You're able to carve out what you desire. I will say though that even with all my praise, I do think that Nintendo wasted a lot of potential here with the Sky Islands. They may be another layer in the map, but there's so much empty space. I do realize that the sky is supposed to be empty. I was just hoping for more interesting islands. Instead, we only have really two or three important islands. And that's just disappointing. And from all the marketing that we got, I thought that the Sky Islands were going to be the main part of the game, alongside Hyrule being updated. That isn't the case, and I do hope that if we ever get an expansion pass for Tears of the Kingdom, that we get new areas to explore in the sky with brand new island type. Since Loftwings are in the game, you might wonder how we get from island to island. I mean, it's not like you can fucking fly. Zonai vehicles are easily the biggest and the coolest addition that we've ever seen in the Zelda franchise to this point. While this isn't the first time that we've seen vehicles in the franchise, this is the first time that we've been able to fully customize and build our own vehicles. Almost reminds me of another game. Since the upheaval wrecked Hyrule, device dispensers have appeared on Sky Islands and in various spots throughout the world. This is how you can get Zonai parts, though it's entirely gotcha. I do wonder why Nintendo's been obsessed with gacha lately. What's next? Fucking gacha in the new Mario game? There's a lot of gears to get in these dispensers. And you don't even need to use them with the Zonai vehicles. You can fuse them with shields or swords to get unique effects, like even a makeshift for Volley's Gale. The device dispensers can drop anything from wheels, steering sticks, fans, wings, balloons, dragon heads. What's next? Metroid Prime 4? Ultra Hand and the Zonai vehicles are so insane, and you can make anything with the only limitation being your imagination and the frame rate. I don't use Reddit a lot, but one of my favorite subreddits is Hyrule Engineering, where you can see where people are taking the game and the Switch to its absolute limits. I highly recommend checking it out if you're interested or need ideas for a future Zonai build. And I've checked it out a few times since I'm a basic bitch. Both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom excel in giving you the freedom to do what you want. And in here, you don't have to make complicated machines. You can just cheese and make simple ones or just make a dick machine. In Tears of the Kingdom, we lose everything, from runes to our hearts to even our arm. While that might be sad at first, we get brand new runes that completely outclass the originals found in Breath of the Wild. Other than remote bombs, I miss them so much. We get four at the beginning, and a fifth one that builds upon one of them. I'll let my good friend Vento Edo talk about them. By the way, he's also the graphic designer for my YouTube channel who made the thumbnail and the graphics for the rune. So please send him some love in the comments down below, please. Something worth bringing up in regards to runes is how they work towards unintended solutions. Ultra Hand itself is already largely flexible in how unlimited you are in the way you can fuse or move. Using whatever you can find to your advantage, Fuse lets you create instant methods of elevation through shield fusing, not just through rockets, but bombs as well. Ascend is more situational overall, but when it works in tandem with the other runes, it can get you to places you usually aren't able to get to very easily. And Recall is the most flexible, having insane range of activation, lots of rewind time, and can be used to get past many challenges through how creatively you use it. It makes the game even more replayable because of the many ways you can break or speedrun through shrines and overworld puzzles, and they want you to do so. 
In both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, we start out with these special abilities called runes in the opening hours of the game. These runes allow us to interact with the puzzles everywhere in the world. The problem, at least for me, is that in Breath of the Wild, the runes aren't exactly the best. They're not bad, especially with remote bombs being amazing for fishing or for blowing up crates, the runes were very limiting. Magnesis only picked up metal objects, Cryonis only made an ice pillar, which was really situational, and Stasis? That's all only really good for speedruns, man. Tears of the Kingdom is much, much better in this regard. I feel like this time, you use each rune much more in the three layers of Hyrule. All of the four beginning runes are so helpful and they allow you to interact with Hyrule in amazing ways that we've never seen before. Additionally, there's this really cool new mini boss that fully utilizes each rune to the maximum by making you have to use each one in order to defeat this flux construct. Also, why the fuck do we have a map rune? This is fucking useless. Tears of the Kingdom is a fantastic follow-up to one of the most beloved games ever that expands it in ways I never would have thought. They added so much to Hyrule, made so many changes to pre-existing features to make them all feel refreshing and unique. With the Sky Islands, the deaths, and everything else, this game satisfied me, and I'm really hoping that this isn't the last time we get to see this Link in Zelda. It brought back so many of the elements that made Zelda special, and what made it so beloved in the first place. This is a legendary game that I know will go down as one of the best games ever created, and I can't wait to cover more of it in part 2, coming out later this year. Nintendo is a studio that I trust completely. While they do come out with duds sometimes, they always manage to surprise me and their players. With them creating new worlds to tinker with, you can always count on Nintendo to push forwards in the gaming industry. Breath of the Wild itself was innovative in nearly every way, with it reinventing both the industry and the Zelda franchise. When its sequel, Tears of the Kingdom, received more trailers, many had doubts about if it was enough to warrant a full-blown sequel. They weren't right at all. Tears of the Kingdom is an amazing experience that everyone is loving. In the first part of the series that I'm making, I talked more about the Zonai and the sky above Hyrule and what that introduced, but now I'm going into an opposite direction, and today we're going to head into the depths of Hyrule, a darkness not seen in generations. Now, join me as we dive into the darkness of the depths, a darkness deep below Hyrule. This is the second part of my series revering Tears of the Kingdom, where I'm going to be talking about everything in the game. This is Tears of the Kingdom Part 2, The Dark Reflection. The deaths were something that we did see a lot of in the marketing for Tears of the Kingdom. While we did see occasional glimpses, I don't think that anybody expected this dark cave area to be as big as Hyrule itself. I myself thought that we were just going to have a few region sized caves, but no. Nintendo did the unthinkable and created a whole nother world, with Hyrule as its base. The Zelda team is insane, and this is why I love Zelda games so much. Unlike other dark worlds in the franchise, the depths is just Hyrule, but inverted and dark. That and a lot of other changes helped to make the the depths an extremely scary and challenging experience for whenever I went down there, at least in the beginning of the game. In past entries, we've seen alternate worlds that reuse the base of Hyrule, such as A Link to the Past and A Link Between Worlds. The Depths was a fantastic way to reuse the map in a way that makes the game feel bigger while not making the developers create two completely different overworlds. If you want to head into this nightmare world, you have to dive into chasms and try not to piss your pants. These chasms might be hidden in wells, plain sight, or... How the fuck was I supposed to find this? I'm getting off track. Okay, so after driving into a chasm, you see a completely different world that is insane to see for the first time. It's only 16 gigabytes. They put so much into this game. With everything that they've already added to the base game, it's a genuine shock to see this added onto the already huge game. While the devs do suffer from there being not a lot to do, I think it's still a great space to explore. You can find various outfits from previous games, arenas, or even previous bosses that you've beaten before. In my previous video about Tears of the Kingdom, I mentioned how each layer of Hyrule has a different gameplay loop. In the devs, we're not finding shrines. Instead, we're finding light roots, which interestingly are located directly below shrines on the overworld, which helped a lot whenever I needed to find shrines of the overworld or light roots in the depths. If you find light roots, you might be able to find some new death exclusive enemies, such as what the fuck, Nintendo? Why are these enemies? They're adorable. Overall, I really like the depths, even if they did like variety, and I do hope that Nintendo expands on this with DLC. But even with all my complaints, I'm fine because of this. Easily the biggest complaint that me and many other players had surrounding Breath of the Wild was, 
the dungeons. I won't hide my feelings on them. They were shit, in variety, visually, and just in general. Other than being able to rotate a chamber or the entire Divine Beast, they felt virtually identical. In each one, you just had to find four terminals and very easy puzzles. Wow, Nintendo. That's so much fun. In previous Zelda games, dungeons were easily one of the biggest things to making Zelda, Zelda. I love the dungeons found in Twilight Princess, with Snow Peak Ruins, Arbiter's Grounds, and so many others being my favorites in the entire series. So that's why it was a huge surprise to see that Tears of the Kingdom brings back dungeons. Though these aren't like traditional dungeons, they feel like halfway between Divine Beasts and actual dungeons. Obviously visually these dungeons look much much better than Divine Beasts and they have actual themes this time. You get a pyramid, a boat, a wellspring, and an ancient city which is all pretty cool. My first dungeon was a Stormwind Arc with Tulane, and I really enjoyed it. While the objective is still similar to the Divine Beast, now you have to find 4 targets and then you have to use the respective sage's ability. This is the case for each temple, and I don't know what to think about it really. Overall, I really did enjoy these temples more than Breath of the Wilds, but it feels like a half step and I would have appreciated them doing more to make these dungeons better. Other than the Stormwind Arc, none of these dungeons are likely to have a lasting impact on me. Overall, they're just okay and it's quite disappointing. The ancient city Garandia was confusing with minecarts, so I resorted to using rockets to cheese the dungeon. The Merle's Myth was actually pretty cool and I really liked the pyramid theming, plus the use of mirrors was great as a lifelong Zelda fan. The ancient wellspring was really frustrating for me, even with the low gravity gimmick being cool. It felt frustrating figuring out how to progress through these dungeons. Plus, the boss for the wellspring was annoying as fuck. I know it sounds like I absolutely hate these dungeons, or just don't like these dungeons at all, but that's not it. The music and the boss fights help to make these dungeons stick out more, and they are a serious step up from the Divine Beast. But I do wish they put more of a focus into making these dungeons better, with better puzzles. Either way, I had a great time, and these temples helped a lot with making Tears of the Kingdom an unforgettable experience. In 2006, the most legendary game ever created came out, and it changed the world. This game was Madden 07 and it revolutionized the gaming industry ever since, with a direct sequel next year with Madden 07. Twilight Princess was a legendary game that, that was the best selling game before Breath of the Wild. A notable thing about Twilight Princess is that until Tears of the Kingdom, this was the last time that we saw Ganondorf in a mainline title. No. Calamity Ganon doesn't count. Even at the beginning of the game, Nintendo doesn't hold back. Even in his weakest form, a mummified state that just came back to life, Ganondorf manages to shatter the Master Sword, the sword that's supposed to seal the darkness. He doesn't stop there, and instead attacks Link with his hatred, sapping away at his health. This is where I knew that Ganondorf was going to be an insane monster, and a fun one at that. Ganondorf was going to be even stronger than what Calamity Ganon was, and that already had destroyed the kingdom. This Ganondorf is bringing a lot of change to Hyrule. As a huge fan of Twilight Princess and Ganondorf himself, I was ecstatic to see him return in Tears of the Kingdom. After Ganondorf awakens from his seal, he brings the kingdom into the Age of Upheaval, which changes Hyrule in so many ways. There are sky islands, new enemies, chasms that go all the way into the depths, and new regional phenomenons that are slowly but surely cutting off the races of Hyrule. Breath of the Wild was awesome, but Calamity Ganon had a limited appearance in the modern times, other than the Blights. I gotta say though, before we continue, I think that it's a real shame that for a majority of the game, we don't get to see Ganondorf himself in the modern times. We know how strong and powerful he is from both cutscenes and the upheaval, but we're just fighting his minions and phantoms. He's just hiding away for the majority of the game. I do understand that he's still recovering from Raru, but it was a little disappointing to see that we did get to see more of Ganondorf, mummified or hot. For the rest of the Ganondorf section, I'll be covering the final boss fight and some of him during the main game, so skip to this time scamp if you wish to be undisturbed. What we do get to see a lot of in Tears of the Kingdom is Ganondorf in the ancient times. In the ancient times of Hyrule, he's a chief of the Gryoto, and eventually he submits himself to the king of Hyrule and backstabs him, or rather the queen. What a surprise, we've never seen this before in the franchise. 
Ganondorf in Tears of the Kingdom reminds me a lot of his Ocarina of Time debut. With what I've said before, but also with his attitude. This is a Ganondorf that we haven't seen before, and he's cocky. For a good reason. I mean, he had a fucking Demon King form that heavily resembles Demise from Skyward Sword. And then further on, we all know that he eventually gets sealed and thousands of years later, we encounter him in the opening hours of the game. Now, I want to talk about the best part about him. No, not his muscles, not his sexy smile, but how he's amazing as a final boss. It's time to return to the beginning of the game, and where it all started. This is where Zelda and Link first went to investigate where the gloom came from. Before fighting Ganondorf himself, we have to fight a few waves of enemies with the help of the sages that he's acquired throughout the game. Well, Ganondorf brings back all the bosses that we defeated, and we have to leave the sages. And now, now it's finally time to fight this bastard. The bastard that killed the beautiful Sonya. <laughs> I'm still not over how he killed off the most beautiful girl. Sorry, I mean the second most beautiful character in Tears of the Kingdom. A major complaint that I had with Breath of the Wild is that the final boss was extremely disappointing and easy. Alongside the Divine Beast melting away half of his health, Calamity Ganon was just not hard at all. It didn't pose a challenge at all. On my second playthrough earlier this year, the only reason why I did beat him on my first try was because the game glitched. I'm not really feeling it. Ganondorf, however, is the complete opposite, and he's so much better than Calamity Ganon ever was. While he's still not the hardest foe ever, it's his second phase that can actually surprise you. Fun fact, he can actually dodge and parry your attacks. I wasn't prepared for this, and I barely survived with only one heart. I only one due to making a rocket shield beforehand. It was late at night, so I had to be quiet, but I couldn't help myself. I was in constant awe by Ganondorf and what he brought to the table. I had so much fun with his boss fight. And I'm so grateful that the Zelda team actually managed to make a worthwhile boss fight. His third and final phase is perhaps the coolest thing in fiction. Frustrated by not winning, he follows Zelda and swallows his tear to go through Drac to go through Drac to go through Drac. How do you say it? To go through Draconification. He rises high into the sky with Link trapped in his fangs. I seriously thought that maybe Link might be screwed. Obviously, this wouldn't happen. Link always wins. This is where the Light Dragon, or Zelda, comes in and frees Link. This phase was a blast, with you riding the Light Dragon until you fall onto the Demon Dragon. While this phase shares similarities with the Beast form of Calamity Cannon, it makes up for it by being so much cooler and better. It was easy as fuck to shoot the Beast form, but here, you actually need to put a little bit of effort, and the ending makes up for it. This isn't hard, but it's so fucking cool compared to shooting an oversized boar. I always thought that Twilight Princess had the best final boss. I still do to an extent, but that doesn't matter. The phases that Ganondorf provides is a good challenge, and at the end, Link fights him one on one for one final battle and finally defeats him. Link stabs him for good. He attacks and cracks the tear until... I keep on saying this, but I have to. Tears of the Kingdom is so good because it adds more to the experience, it adds more to the battles, it adds more to everything. I know everyone won't like the new open world of Zelda and the new formula that Breath of the Wild introduced, but Tears of the Kingdom shows us that Zelda is still Zelda. The series evolves and remixes ideas from the past to make an experience that we fans will never forget. By the time this video is released publicly, it'll been have been nearly two months since Tears of the Kingdom released, and it's still in my mind every day. With over 200 hours in this game, I can confidently say that I love Tears of the Kingdom in every way. While of course there is missed potential here and there, this game already did and introduced so much that even more wouldn't be required for me to consider this game to be a masterpiece. All throughout the video, I've talked about the darkness of Hyrule and how it contributed to an amazing game. This is the second part of my review on Tears of the Kingdom. The third and final part will come out later this year, so go to Lookout Landing and look out for that video. See you, and be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoy this video. The Zelda franchise is no stranger to direct sequels throughout its lifetime. We've gotten Zelda 2, Majora's Mask, Phantom Hourglass, a Link Between Worlds, and so many more. It should have been no surprise that Breath of the Wild was getting a direct sequel. Breath of the Wild was a legendary game in the series that redefined everything, and it also sold incredibly well, selling nearly double of what Twilight Princess had sold previously, and that at the time was a best-selling title in the franchise. And for some fucking reason we never got a direct sequel to Twilight Princess. I'm still salty about that. 
Even though Breath of the Wild was a masterpiece, it had its issues. The enemy variety was lacking, there's no real reason to attack enemy camps, and no Link's Awakening costume. Of course, it's a fantastic game, but a direct sequel would be perfect to fix many of its issues and bring new ideas to the table. In the previous two parts in the series, I've been discussing everything there is to know about Tears of the Kingdom, but now, as I finish up the series, I want to look into perhaps the most important part about it, the part that would determine if Tears of the Kingdom was a worthy success. In universe, around eight years have passed since Breath of the Hey, future Matthew here, and this is wrong. We don't have definitive date, and I base the eight years off of Hudson and Ronson's daughter, but there's no age set in the game. And in real life, around six years. I mean, Link is old enough to where he can drink alcohol. While Tears of the Kingdom is a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, the story is in a direct continuation, and there are only references to the previous title, which is both good and bad in different ways. It feels disappointing that they didn't tell us directly what happened to things like the Divine Beasts or the Sheikah Towers, but it's fine. We got more interesting replacements anyways. Oh, by the way, play Breath of the Wild before you play Tears of the Kingdom. Other than the gameplay and a lot of things making more sense if you've played this game, it's worth it all on its own because of Verbosa. Other than the lack of Cass, which sucks by the way, the biggest change that you'll see in Hyrule is that the Sheikah tech is completely gone. Well, for the most part. Guardians, Shrines, and Sheikah Towers have all been disassembled since I assume Zelda doesn't want to be traumatized anymore. Interestingly enough, some of the Sheikah tech has been repurposed to traumatize Link, I mean, to create Skyview Towers, Tears of the Kingdom's versions that launches him into the sky to scan the surrounding area. In Breath of the Wild, you just had to climb the Sheikah Towers, which while they did give a challenge for some of them, I didn't really find it that hard. They were quite easy for the most part. For the Skyview Towers, however, they're completely different. First, you have to find a way inside, and it's quite clever how you have to do it. There's just Skyview Towers stuck in snow, with a terminal loose, and one in an enemy base. I really like this change, as now you actually have to think about how you're supposed to get inside. This is only the first step into re-exploring Hyrule. There's a new town, a blizzard, a drug epidemic, and Koroks with backpacks. And one of the new biggest changes in the overworld is Lookout Landing, which is Hyrule's newest town that sounds straight out of Fortnite. This is one of the first things that we see that indicates that Hyrule is rebuilding, which is a common theme throughout the game that you'll see a lot. So yeah, Hyrule has changed a lot in between this game and Breath of the Wild. There are caves, chasms, sky islands, enemy camps, new Korok puzzles. What else can they possibly add? Oh. My. Gosh. After the upheaval strikes Hyrule, each of the major regions is suffering from a major phenomenon. With a blizzard in Hebra Village, a Gibdo invasion in Gerudo Town, Zora's domain is being polluted, and Goron City is suffering from... a crack addiction. In Breath of the Wild, the threat of the Divine Beast was there, but other than Varuta, I didn't really feel like they were super dangerous. But here, you can actively see how the people of each race are suffering. It helps to let us know that Ganondorf is a menace. Thankfully, these regional phenomenons aren't the only new things in Hyrule. In each major settlement, there are new additions in small and in big ways, which I'm really happy for. My favorites were the bunker in Grudo Town, which is really cool, and Zora's Domain, where a court made in the memory of Mipha was created. Goron City's new additions are a bit boring, though it's made up by Death Mountain feeling completely different with no lava anywhere. Rito Village has got to be great. We could get an igloo, we could get an expanded flight range, and we can get... Why is there a house? And that's not it just for Hyrule. There are so many little and big changes that it's impossible to list all of them. From new puzzles, collectibles, to even Addison, an employee from Hudson who's fucking bad at his job. Love the commitment though. Hyrule has changed a lot in only a few years, and I loved returning to see every new change. Even the great fairies have changed a lot, with their locations changing alongside a new way to open them up that doesn't require you to go into debt. Instead, you have to go through this awesome quest chain to rebuild a musical true, and I thought it was awesome. Plus, near the end, there's a sick Xenoblade reference, which is amazing for a Xenoblade fan. As a direct sequel- <laughs> As a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild that builds upon, like everything, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that the combat is mostly unchanged. Weapons break, time slows when you use your bow in the air, you still have to worry about your stamina, and you can't pet dogs. 
What they have changed helps to make the combat feel a lot better. There are still issues obviously, but I think this helps to just make it more fun in general. The first major change is the Fuse ability. Fuse offers endless possibilities that has so much fun to tinker with. It incentivizes you to explore and to fight big baddies everywhere. In addition, certain weapons now have unique traits that offer unique abilities under a certain condition. Zonite weapons get stronger if you fuse a Zonite material to it. Magic rods make magic better. Duh. And a lot more that would be too tiring for me to say in one video. While the combat is essentially unchanged from Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom adds a lot that makes you strategize with the materials that you have. While breaking was Breath of the Wild's most controversial feature, it also adds strategy and did critical damage when it was broken. Tears of the Kingdom works on that system and makes it feel less frustrating while also being better. Another thing that I would say that Breath of the Wild didn't do well combat wise were the runes. I do understand that they were more focused on interacting with the world, but at the same time, you could upgrade stasis to affect enemies. But stock shit. It only lasts for a few seconds, and it lasts shorter when you need to run up to them. Tears of the Kingdom is much better in this regard. Instead of changing runes via the up button, you just have to hold down the L button and an ability will opens up. This is much better and lets you choose in the heat of the battle. Unless if you choose the map on accident. That's happened to me more than I'd like to admit. A feature introduced in Breath of the Wild was that you could throw weapons. It wasn't great, and I don't recommend it for most weapons. But you can't throw things. It's a cool feature if you like to throw things. Tears of the Kingdom, as usual, built upon this feature, and now you can throw anything you want. New items like the Muddle Bottle, Bright Bloom Seeds, and Elemental Fruits are all that benefit a lot from being thrown. You can use arrows for Bright Bloom Seeds like Joshua suggested, but don't listen to that fucker. Save your arrows, even though you can get a lot. One of the best things in Breath of the Wild were the champion abilities. They made you feel really insane and powerful. Bosa's Fury was really cool for decimating foes. Rivali's Gale is great for traversing the tall mountains. Mifa's Grace is a great backup that fully heals you. Daruk's protection is... it's okay, I guess. So, what does Tears of the Kingdom offer as a replacement? What does it improve? It's gotta be something exciting, something that we've never seen in the franchise before. My guess is something really cool like being able to surf, or maybe something even cooler that we never would have thought of. <sighs> By far the most annoying and disappointing part of Tears of the Kingdom are the sages. I guess they wanted to take the general concept of the champions, but massively upgrade them, but instead they made them really frustrating. Instead of each ability being binded to a button, you have to go up to them and press A to activate their ability. That by itself is annoying, but I can live with it. What makes it worse is that they don't listen to you at all, and they get in your way constantly. After I'm done fighting an enemy and I'm trying to pick up their loot, I'll accidentally activate Tulin and the wind blows away all the enemies It makes me want to bash my head into a wall. The others are less annoying, but at the same time, I wonder why Nintendo didn't think this through. Easily, most of them could have been put to abundant input. Tulin's ability only should have been activated when you're gliding or in the air. Yenobo? Just make him not screw up vehicles, please. Sidon could be like Duruk's protection, but you just have to pull out your shield once. With Riju? It would just have been better if it activated when pulling out your bow. Mineru is... Just make her stronger, please. She is ridiculously weak. She's only really good with frost emitters, which can still screw you in battle. I don't think the concept of the sages are bad, but man, they're implemented horribly, and I constantly had to go in the menu to turn most of them off when exploring or fighting an enemy. I understand that a major theme of Tears of the Kingdom is that you're not alone anymore. You're able to rely on others, and the scene near the end of the game shows that off perfectly. But in regular gameplay, it sucks, and I hate the sages. Something that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom share is that their gameplay loop in Hyrule itself is very similar. You go to towers, scan an area, find a shrine, and do a lot of bullshit in between. So, how do they make the gameplay loop even better? How can they make the shrines stand out compared to the Sheikah ones? Well, first of all, they look so much better visually, and they play better too in my opinion. There's 152 this time versus 120, but I feel like somehow they made it more varied and more fun to play through this time. For example, combat shrines here are completely different and instead strip you of everything at the beginning and put you into an enemy encampment with different puzzles, which is great. I always dreaded going to the boring combat trial shrines in Breath of the Wild, with there only being really three different types that just gave you different guardian scouts to defeat. 
I would also say that puzzles in these shrines are also much cooler that focus more on using your runes, but if you do get stuck, you can cheese them. A surprising amount really with rocket shields. It makes me conflicted as on one hand sometimes I get stuck and this helped me not to look up solutions, on the other hand, it feels like Nintendo didn't test these shrines out enough. And also, Shrines of Blessings return of course, but now, they look so fucking real. And they feel like a real blessing. Just look at it. The version feels bland in comparison, and small. And there's water, for some reason. Tears of the Kingdom is so much cooler and feels more mystical in hindsight. After countless hours of recording, editing, and re-recording, the longest series I've ever made is finally over. Video games as a whole is something that I love so much, and it's games like Tears of the Kingdom that truly shows it off, alongside the Zelda series showing everyone what it is to be a video game. Tears of the Kingdom is going to be beloved for generations to come, just like Breath of the Wild and Ocarina of Time did when they released years and years ago. As a game, Tears of the Kingdom fixed nearly every issue I and many other people had with Breath of the Wild. It added the much needed gameplay variety that the original lacked. It added onto a masterpiece and is so good. Tears of the Kingdom adds and changes so much that it makes Breath of the Wild feel like a tech demo. And it itself was already revolutionary. We all hate Nintendo's bullshit sometimes, but it's games like these that remind me why I've always had a soft spot for Nintendo games ever since I became a gamer all the way back in 2012. There's a reason why people like Zelda. There's a reason why the series is so beloved. It's because the developers go above and beyond with each title that makes each experience memorable and innovative in ways that most never would have thought about. The Switch has been an amazing era for both players and the Zelda franchise alike. From Breath of the Wild to all the way to Tears of the Kingdom, the Switch has made the series better than ever before. This is a masterpiece. This is amazing. This changed everything. This is The Legend of Zelda. Tears of the Kingdom. As I close my thoughts on this, there's one thing I need to say. I love Tears of the Kingdom, regardless of its issues. People could rag on the game for the story, reuse music, and so much more. And yet, this is such a lovely game, and I don't think we'll ever see something like this again. I'm just happy this exists, and I can't wait for the next Zelda game. Thanks for watching. Matthew is out of here!